We never know where life will lead us or what may hinder us along the way. But while every day can feel like one big question mark, it doesn't have to. With the right insights, strategies, and solutions from Western and Southern Financial Group, together we can look ahead to leave the unknown behind. Buddy, buddy, buddy. I am stoked for this episode. We have a ton of mailbag questions. We got the Quitty Pay interview at the back end. And I'm opening it up with the story about my mom getting on Manteca's most wanted list in California. I haven't heard this one either, so I'm I'm excited too. This is gonna be a twofer, by the way. Okay. A twofer because someone also added, I'd love to hear how Austin's mom and dad met. So I gotta paint the picture a little bit. My dad starts a little bit earlier. My dad was kicked out of his house from his dad when he was 16. My dad's dad, my grandpa, was a meth dealer for the Hells Angels, one of the motorcycle clubs in California, one of the famed motorcycle clubs. My dad had to get out of that situation for a lot of reasons, whatever it may be. My dad gets out at 16. He's been a mechanic working on cars since he was 16 years old at Reinick Tyronado and some other places after that. My mom, classic, had to get her car fixed. Dad scoops her up as a mechanic. You're like, hey, you need your car fixed? What else do you need fixed? My dad was like 19 at the time. My mom... I think a year older at 20, whatever it may have been. Um, and to paint the picture a little bit further, my dad is like 5'6". My mom is six foot. Like that's this height difference that we're talking here. Like they are legitimately nearly a foot off. Like it's an absurd pairing is what it was. Um, so that's how they met. He was a mechanic. She was a six foot, you know, person. I don't even know what she was doing back then. But that's how they originally met. And so let's go back to, to my mom here. So they were married for two, three years, potentially. They had my sister when they were, my dad was like 20 and my mom was like 22. And then me when he was like 21 or whatever it was. Um, and they got divorced. I'm a divorced kid. You know, that's common. Like half of the United States. Okay. Don't send me this pity here. Uh, they were, they got divorced when I was three. My mom threw a full chair at him. A full chair is the story. Well, my dad tells it better than I do, but she threw a full chair at him and he was like, that was the straw that broke the camel's back among other things. Of course, no one's perfect. Um, but then my mom, she got custody out of the gate because she was quickly in another relationship with a guy with a really good job and had more money than my dad at the time, who was just like a stay at home, not stay at home dad, but like single dad with a mechanic job. So I was with my mom for the from like when I was three until like I was like seven when like things ended up changing for this reason. Uh, my mom is known for Grand Theft Auto. She was a legitimate monster in terms of stealing cars. She could steal a car and start it within a minute and 30 seconds. She showed me. So if you have these cars... In the, like Hondas and Toyotas in like the 90s, the car key to open the door and start the car between like a 90 Honda and a 90 Toyota to like a 99 was very similar. So she had a key ring of like 100 keys that like could open pretty could much open any this. car of that type. So if she saw any of those in the parking lot, you know, wherever she was doing, she could just rip and roar, you know, and go through all these cars. And she didn't steal them to joyride them necessarily. She stole them to sell them and strip them. Um, but she, her her final her final piece was um, her the relationship she had with that guy who had a nice job that ended up not working out. It was just me, my sister, and her at the time, and we're like bouncing around like from hotel to hotel, trying to find a place to stay and this kind of stuff. And then she, to kind of cap off her Grand Theft Auto, steals a U-Haul full of a bunch of stuff. And stealing a U-Haul is a little bit different because it's easier to spot. You know, there's a stolen U-Haul compared to like stolen Honda Civic of the billion in the world. Yeah. So she still a U-Haul. We're in it, you know, grinding it out. Um, I'm like six or whatever it was. And um, it was just easier to spot her. She's, she's trying to drive to her next spot and then she gets caught up in the, uh, the U-Haul game. And then um, she does a year in prison, I believe. They call it a bullet is what a year in prison is called. I learned that from her. Uh, uh, she did a year in prison in one of the only like women prisons in California, in Chowchilla, California. And she's lived there ever since, grinding it out in Chowchilla, California after she got out. So that was, uh, that's I, the- I, 
hope she's out the Grand Theft Auto game? She's out the Grand Theft okay. Auto game, which is honestly, you know, really good. She could still steal a car. She showed me. She could freaking light a car on. If she could so get she into sometimes a car do it just to like get the rush and then get put it back. I don't know that though, but maybe she does. We don't talk a ton, but I do think that that's a possibility. But that that is the extent of the uh, the most wanted story. It's a pretty damn good one though. She uh she's a stud, an absolute stud. Uh, some some people have you know everyone has different skills. You know what I mean? Like I can. I can shotgun a beer pretty quickly, pretty good at beer dye. My mom could probably steal your dad's car. Like, I don't know what to tell you, but that's where we're at on that. Um, all right, let's go ahead now and dive mailbag. into this mailbag here. We have to dive into this mailbag. I am I am super stoked because we just get, we get so many questions. And we it really have, is. It's, it's all like, I was telling you before, we have to like emphasize the people because I get a lot of DMs on Twitter asking and we said we're prioritizing reviews. So if you really want it answered, and if we haven't answered yours and you send us a message on some platform, go leave a review. We will get to every single one of those at least. And so questions for next week. We already had to put some review yeah, questions, some DM questions, so some here. YouTube comments for next week. Um, Palbertson is one, you know, Soto Shuffle, D-Nail, um, we will Observe get Man 24, Con Nick Z, Conrad, who Instagram DM'd me, Patrick Fessler. Like We're going to get to those next week. I'm sorry. But for now, let's start with these ones, and we're going to kick it off with an absolute gem of a, a review. An yeah, absolute gem. Really it was only a four-star. <laughs> Could be a five-star. Here are his positives. And this guy has like... We're trying to change his mind to get him to make it a five-star. Yes. This is by far the most informative and thorough podcast on the football podcast on the planet. Most comprehensive review of analytics of any podcast I've listened to. These are the positives, by the way. They are straight to the point and don't waste your time with senseless rifting. No filler material. The cover, what, they cover what they say they're going to cover. Don't lean on guests slash third parties for content. All true. Intro is always a little cringe, but it's necessary. These They're the football negatives. nerds. Mike has the most punchable voice slash face in podcasting. <laughs> I've never heard that, that got before. Me. That, I've never heard punchable voice. I do hate my voice, though. I think a lot, it's a common, but I really I actually hear that from more people, voice. yeah. Everyone um, hates your voice. I, your voice is great. Mine, not great. But punchable face is actually the first time I've ever gotten that. I can see like we'll at, everyone has their people type. are like dude shut the f up man like no one wants to hear your voice like yeah. it, and it sucks that you have to battle through that if you just punch me in the throat you cover both it's with true the nose. you don't have a punchable voice. face you have a punchable throat that's what he should have said <laughs> they are certainly they certainly feed their own narrative and often cherry pick to highlight certain teams and players hey welcome to the draft game <laughs> completely overlook certain players slash teams for some reason i understand not every good to great player can be in the limelight but come on next rational step hot female co-star i'm not against that i was just say that's where like he he was losing you're me telling me quinn's not a right hot co-star i mean i am i'm not i you know not female. i could throw a wig on or something like that i don't know if that's really gonna help but i still think quinn's a hot co-star getting co -star. a female involved though i'm not opposed i'm not opposed so not he didn't have of, a question though <laughs> that was just yeah we're trying to convince to change that to a five star all right deal. we'll get you well let's get to the first question then jj who Hey guys, from the mailbag, I wanted to ask what's what you all what your opinion was of UK linebacker Jamin Davis or Jamin Davis. He had a breakout year by stats at a PFF grade and recently declared, which seems like a poor decision, but must mean the NFL is fairly high on him given the history within the program of guys declaring early. Your thoughts? He has, so I had not hand up, had not watched him prior to him declaring because there's only so many guys and so much time, and you overwork me here. So <laughs> If that changes, maybe I'll get to these guys next year. But no, he. I watched him, went back, watched. He's rightful to declare in this draft class. Nice. I think he'll be a day two pick at linebacker because he has that body type the NFL loves. Six foot four, 234 pounds, that long, lean, long arms, take on blocks, but still cover and shut down passing lane windows. And I thought he played the run a lot better then I kind of expected like six foot four, two thirty four is a skinny linebacker still. Like six foot two thirty four is that's fine size, but six foot four, two thirty four is like a that that was a safety uh fifteen years ago. Like that, <laughs> that's still on the that's still a slightly built dude. But I thought he really played the run well, had eighty seven point five run defense grade this past season, really only one year starter this past year as a starter. But I think you'll be hearing about him a lot more come draft time. From slightly mailbag question. What do you think of the two wide receiver prospects, George Pickens and Dominic Blaylock, who will be draft eligible next year coming out of Georgia? He also added, love the pod. And I think this is, when you ask questions about 
2022 draft eligible players. It sometimes will take, we'll po- probably push these questions to the following week so we can actually go back and watch some of these yeah, guys. And that's right. a big reason why we push this one. Well, but going back and watching Pickens, I know Pickens is that big monster contested catch guy for Georgia. There's yeah. also that tight end on Georgia, that like true the freshman. freshman guy. <laughs> what is really that? Is. Like that looks insane. He does not look <laughs> human. Uh, anyway, talk to me about okay. Pickens and Blaylock. Pickens. Uh, so I, I don't love the 2022 receiver class. Mm-hmm. I think the two best ones right now play for Ohio State. Gary I would agree. Chris Olave. After that. I like Chris Olave over Rashad Bateman, who a lot of people are flocking to right now. His dominator rating, his breakout age is great. I, I think Chris Olave is a better receiver prospect than Bateman was, is this year, but he's obviously going back to school. After that, there's no guy who you can really put a pin in and say, yeah, that's first round guy. Like coming in this year, we're like Waddle, Devontae Smith, Bateman. Chase. Chase. First round guys. This year, I, I don't really see that outside of those two for Ohio State. Pickens would be in that kind of next tier. To me, he would, if he was like on the draft board this year, would be in like the 60s, 70s range where like back into the second round. But I still think he needs to get stronger. Like he has the body type to be like a 6'3", 215 guy. Right now he's 6'3", 200. Like he's still not, he, he's, his play style is like a 6'3", 215 guy. That's who he should become in time. Because he's a physical dude, not necessarily the most explosive, uh, but very good catch radius, very good ball skills. Blaylock's the more intriguing one to me. Towards the ACL this past season, played all we have him is his freshman tape, but he looks like a four three guy, at least a low four four guy. The guy can scoot, and we'll see how he comes back from the ACL. Love to see that though. But played a lot in the slot, like not a lot of real routes there, and didn't actually play a ton of like period. Like was not a full time starter. So I'm interested to see what he does in 2021 for sure. I think the, you know, when you have receivers, like I think another receiver in this class who wasn't asked to run a different, a ton of different routes and wor- mostly worked in the slot is Mon Ross St. Brown. He's mentioned in the next mailbag question. But like talking to Brandon Ayuk, which we did on the last episode, if you didn't listen to last yesterday's episode, check out the Brandon Ayuk interview. But it's like he knew that one of the biggest knocks on him was he didn't run a ton of routes at Arizona State. And like yeah. you can only control what you can control. And that's why when you are evaluating wide receiver talent, you have to look for traits, explosiveness, you know, uh, ball skills, like these these specific yeah. traits, not necessarily, and you, you can only knock a guy so much for running the routes he was asked to run. And, mm-hmm. and I think similarly with Justin Jefferson, like he worked mostly in the slot, saw a ton of off coverage, like you knock him because you haven't seen it, but at a certain point you have to do evaluate those traits so you can get a good understanding of like, if we did put him in this role in the NFL and did ask him to run more routes, can he do it? And I think that's where a lot of the private workouts, the conversation, you know, when you guys interview these guys, like I think that's where a lot of that stuff comes out in the pre-draft process when you're when you're talking to these guys and working them out privately it's like hey dude let's run some different routes here if i brought, if i brought brandon Ayuk in, in the pre-draft process is for a private workout i'm asking him to run everything on the route tree and see how he does yeah. and like then your receivers coach and your staff are just like oh wow he can do it and that's when you start you know the san francisco 49ers and wes welker trade up for his ass and grab him at the back end of the first round all right max oddlung what should the seahawks do in the draft with their second round pick this is I, I feel bad for I, I always felt like this too when I was uh before I was an analyst and like a big Raiders fan like there were times where you don't have a first round pick or like your picks Carson were, Palmer trade yeah yeah, yeah or yeah. something like that and it's like man I love the draft but we don't have any picks it sucks like I, I think this is where he's at right now but what they don't have a first or a third round pick <laughs> what do they do with their second round pick or do they trade some players away to get more early round picks and then he added again where do you think Amon Ross St. Brown can go and what is his fit yeah it was like that year the Cowboys traded their first for Amari Cooper mm-hmm. and tr- and mock drafts had like the worst year ever in terms of views. Because yes. Just like no, no, no Cowboys, Cowboys fans were in that. But now they're picking 10, right? Or like 11. Yeah, so I, the cow, so first off, the Seahawks question offensive line. Like I, I still, you're not good enough there. Like, and you saw it against the Rams. Like you're, you just need to be better along the offensive line. You need to pass protect when you're going to go up against Aaron Donald and that 49ers defensive line four times a year. You just gotta, like, you gotta be better there. So, Deep off, and it's a deep offensive line class is also why I say that. So, Liam like Liam Meikenberg, if he's there, Walker Little, Stanford tackle. I think that's where you're looking at in the second round, ideally. If you're them, it's just you can't be, you can't have that continue to be an issue as Russell Wilson ages. Where do you think Amon Ross St. Brown goes? Second round, I would love if the Patriots or the Cardinals, right there in the smack dab in the middle of the second round. I think they both have second round picks. Uh, if they don't go wide receiver in the first round, I think the fit for both of them would be good. I, I, he's not, he doesn't have great uh, contested catch ability. Like he he's, has shown some issues at the catch point, not been great there, but he's very good route runner. 
I, I just think a very sound receiver that's more of like a second round type of receiver. You don't see necessarily the high end, high end with him. Yeah, I think day two makes the most sense for him. I, I think in the second round, and I think it also depends on how you want to play him and what you're going to ask him to do. Because I mean, so much of what he did at USC was work from the slot. And when you did right see him though, year, though. When, you, when you did see him work on the outside, there are some reps where you see him work against press, and you are a little bit impressed. And remember, the St. Brown guys mm-hmm. are freaks. These these guys are legitimate athletes. I think in the back, I wrote the background for Amon Ross St. Brown. He knows he can speak three languages fluently. I think it's French, German, and English. He's like like honor roll in high school. But can like, he speak football? Can that's he speak football? That's true. And I apologize for not bringing that up. He speaks four languages and football is the fourth. <laughs> Does he stretch? He doesn't, I know stretch. doesn't stretch. No St. Brown brother stretches. I've said this quote probably a thousand times. I'll say it again. No St. Brown brother stretches because cheetahs don't stretch. That's 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 the, that's what their dad told them. Like, that's what they do. Their dad, I bet you have to pull watch the, all the time, though. She just have to. No, I'm kidding. But the name of the documentary, I think, is like Master Plan or something because it's about the, the, the dad and yeah. his master plan to like build three monsters and yeah. Osiris St. Brown is a freshman or a sophomore at Stanford you obviously have Equanimia St. Brown who Played went to Notre Dame went and now with the Green Bay Packers and then Amon Ross St. Brown of USC and the the other interesting bit from that HBO documentary is um his wife the mom of them was like a former like um bodybuilder or something like they, they both of them are yeah freaky parent athletes and then their sons are obviously uh, in in a similar vein all right Bruno Perkovich is Phil Jerkovich, QB of Boston College, and any good so far? How is he looking, and what is his potential? You say this asked by Bruno Perkovich, like is this is Phil, this Phil Jerkovich's Jerkovich dad, or is it just him trying to fake a name? Could be, could be. Yeah, uh, that but, would be a terrible way of faking a name. That's what I'm saying. Anything <laughs> so else. Close. There's some there's some reviews here that are just like random letters thrown together. But Bruno Perkovich, Bruno Perkovich. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, what, what's your opinion of Jerk? Uh, so he was started his career at Notre Dame. Brian Kelly. When he was recruited, best quarterback. I guess quarterback. Yeah, I know. Remember recruited. that. I don't necessarily see why. Like he's 6'5", 225, and kind of mobile for a guy that size. Usually, you wouldn't expect him to be able to run, but he's not. It's not Trey Lance. He's not Justin Fields. He can't run like that. And he doesn't have a strong arm. Is the thing. Like he, you would expect a six foot five quarterback who's a highly touted recruit to have a cannon, and he really hasn't developed that whatsoever. Like he's kind of got. Like, I think Mac Jones has a stronger arm than him, and that's kind of damning. Uh, so, and then, like, so you're not going to draft him for that. And then on the football field, how he's actually played has not been great either. And now he doesn't have a ton of weapons at BC, but like, it overcome to some degree only 66.7 passing, passing grade this past season. He's kind of not really even on the NFL radar, I'd say, at this point. Sadly. Do you think he goes by Jerk? I kind of like Jerk as a nickname for Phil Jerkovich. No? Yeah, that'd be cool. Like I'd, I'd be, I'd go by that. I'd I go saying. by Jerk too. Yeah. Uh, Shaplito plays. Or Jerko. Jerko. Jerko's Jerko. actually pretty fire. Uh, Shaplito plays. Do you think the Titans go corner in the first round or wide receiver or insert your position with Corey Davis probably leaving and Adoree Jackson underperforming and both positions being so deep in this draft? Pass rusher is a glaring hole, but I just don't see a big contributor worth a first. When, when you could get a player on day two of a similar skill set to develop. I think there are players with the first. I'll just say in this edge class, mm-hmm. like I and I think they will go in the first two because, like we said, the guys who are six foot five with thirty four plus inch arms that run four sixes go in the first round. They they don't go to pick whatever they're going to fifty five or whatever they're going to have in the second round. They're going to go in the twenties where you're drafting this year. So that's where you got to find them. So I I do still think edge is the best if you are. They have Christian Fulton there in kind of in tow at the cornerback position to take over for whoever ends up, you know, moving on first. Um, I know they have Khalif Raymond, who's a speed wide receiver, but I think adding some juice to that receiver position, like starting a guy who's like starting across from AJ Brown, could help too. As Corey Davis was not was not that like and with how much play action they run. Like once you put in Khalif Raymond, they're like, oh, that guy's going to run deep. Like kind of is a, mm-hmm. a tell. You're getting a starter like that, like a Tylen Wallace in the second round, Kadarius Tony maybe in the first round, I think could also, if I'm going that route. Dude, Kadarius Tony and AJ Brown, it'd be fun. Talk about some yak. That's what like I, I think that would, if like I said, if we're not going to go defense here, that's where I'd roll. But if, but I also but realistically, like, you have here Tylen Wallace too. I, yeah. I like him as a second round guy. Like I think he, 
has is has really improved over his career at Oklahoma State. And like I was down on him compared to others early in the process, but like going back and watching him and knowing that he's gonna be like the second round day two type of guy, like I like Wallace yeah. as a value on day two. Because I, I like his ball skills. I think he can't he's not like an elite separator, but he can create separation on the outside and like just wins down the football field. I I like Wallace as like a day two option. I do too. Yes. Uh, he is not I think everyone's calling him a day two because he's not he himself is not necessarily a complete wide receiver like mm-hmm. he, you saw him get his like butt kicked at the line of scrimmage by Trey Brown of Oklahoma who's five also nine, that if you look at the Tulsa game where they have those two big ass corners on the outside yeah they, like he got bullied a bit one yeah. at the catch point like a great ball skills but like wasn't separating at an elite yeah. rate and I think that's where the concerns are and why maybe you're pushing but him he does have some two. juice to him so easy breezy when ordering a beer with Sam Monson, does he say, well, objectively, Coors is a superior is superior to Miller? That's just what the numbers tell us. Because I think he says that a lot on the NFL podcast. I'll lead with this. Sam Monson doesn't drink. I've never seen him order a beer. Yeah, I haven't either. I don't think he Wait, drinks. Think Sam that, and Steve think, don't drink. I think maybe like right at the beginning of when I started at PFF, I saw him drink once, but not since. He's told me stories about like how he drank a ton in, as a kid and like doesn't do it anymore. In Ireland. In Ireland. But I will also say I really respect using your five-star review question on a joke like that. I, yeah, I respect that's that That's fair. That. That's very yeah. fair. And that that would be on brand for him to mm-hmm. choose the wrong beer also. Though. Sam and Steve don't drink, though. Steve definitely doesn't drink. I don't think I've – he's never drank in the time I've been here. And I think it's because he has, like, what, eight kids? Like, he's competing with Rivers in that regard? <laughs> yeah. I, I think he used, he used to drink before he had kids, and then uh, it was just like – Once you have five which, or six kids, it's like a beer doesn't hit the same. Although it's like my brother had two <laughs> kids, and now he drinks every day. So I don't know. Okay. Maybe, maybe it affects different people, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, you all cope in their own way. Steve also homeschools his kids. And I feel like you can't really drink when you're homeschooling kids. I don't know. It, Are they it, even it, school age? I, I don't just know, had actually. them. I don't know what's going on there. It's it's an it's a wild family. It's like a clown car in some ways. Um, Ryan from it's Chicago. Like that one what was that one show or that one movie? Like, cheaper by the dozen. By the dozen. Yeah, 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 yeah. There you go. More expensive by the dozen though, because yeah. those kids. Yeah, <laughs> larger anyway. by the dozen. That's a baker's dozen. That's a baker's dozen. I like it. All right. Uh, this is uh, from a po- from the Apple Podcast review. Ryan from Chicago. Oh one. Have you guys watched Divine Diablo yet? Absolutely the best name in the draft. I would agree. Name alone should get him into day two. And honestly, I'm not I'm not going to counter that argument. We're, we're going to have to put out our name big board. Mm-hmm. All name big board in this class. But before Maybe. we do that, we have to have parameters. Because you have guys like Smoke Monday, who their name isn't actually Smoke, but they go by Smoke. He's not in the class. Though. No, but I'm saying if you yeah, were going to yeah. build this out, you have to have yeah. set parameters. Like Greedy Williams. Real Wap Fillier. Like his name's actually not Wap, but like if we're, whoppers. if we're including. I think if it's a name that is on your official whatever page at your school then yeah deal i think that's fair so we'll we'll put out that big board maybe in a couple weeks after the senior bowl we'll do our official big board so yeah he said he hasn't seen him much and just want to see what you guys thought of him his name's actually his name's ryan from chicago in the review but his also name is ryan mack mm. uh divide diablo massive safety 6 3 227 had a good coverage grade this last year, but I, like you're not playing him at safety at the NFL level. He's he's not that caliber of athlete, and honestly, like he wasn't that, even that like special an athlete to be like, oh, he'd be a great coverage player for a linebacker. Like I'm not necessarily sure I see that. Definitely a draftable prospect for sure, but he did not actually end up making the cut for our guide one. So He'll probably not day two. two on name alone. Then maybe day three on name alone. Yeah. All right. Um, mailback question here from Harris the Scout or Harry the Scout. Um, now that the Chargers hired Brandon Staley, what are the biggest needs on defense? Any ideal prospect fits? Love the pot. I think defensive line. The If you go back and just watch their defense, uh, how it was kind of schemed, it relied on the front four getting pressure. They were not going to blitz. They were going to drop into coverage, and they were going to keep everything in front of them. They didn't really give a shit about their linebackers. The linebackers were not their coverage players. It was everyone else they didn't ask the linebackers to cover a lot of ground um but it worked because if you had to hold on to the ball and get to your check down every once in a while aaron donald was going to kick the shit out of the guard in 2.5 seconds and be in the quarterback's face and that it wasn't going to get to his check down and all of a sudden you're behind the sticks and that's how they thrived you have a guy in joey bosa there with the chargers that can kind of do that you don't have a second fiddle right now melvin ingram's going to hit free agency He's also kind of on the downside of his career. You got to keep that strength the strength. I'm of the opinion that he kicked Jerry Tillery outside. And so the perfect prospect fit, in my opinion, Christian Barmore at 13. Let him wreak some havoc from the interior. Man. Let him be that guy that 
that uh, interior pocket pusher. And I think Terry Tillery, from what we saw, was actually a lot better brushing the passer from the edge. He was so much better on the edge. It I also yeah. think, though, in those games where he was performing well, he was going against a bad off the tackles. But no, like, but like even when he was like just randomly kicked out there, mm -hmm. he looked better. Add Christian Barmore, then you got Joey Bosa, and you're probably going to Definitely. lose Melvin Ingram in free agency. Like that, I think is a is a really nice. We fit. do need to like to have a talk about free agency at some point though, because this year's free agency is going to be wild. Just, yeah, yeah. Like I'm interested about how we'll do it. Maybe after the Senior Bowl, because yeah. Senior Bowl is next week. So yeah. we probably gotta... there is like a we do have like a month in there that just nothing happens in February, True. especially now with combine. Yeah, gone. February is going to be big. February is going to be big for free agency. Big for mailbags. We could do two mailbags in a week. Whoa, hello, just catch up. We you could know just I mean? like constantly do mailbags. Just never even talk about what we want to talk about. <laughs> Have them dictate, you know, give the power to the people. I kind of, I don't hate it. Live call in shows. Wow. All right. Uh, this is from Ajax underscore 1624. Great mailbag. Great pod. Best and most practical insight into the draft. With the Jets hiring Salah and presumably being the in the Shanahan offense with LaFleur or McDaniels, is Wilson the better fit than Fields? Or should they make a play for Watson? Also, hashtag fun to watch. Deontay Brown, a.k.a. Cornbread. Someone reached out and said his nickname is Cornbread, the monster for Alabama, the left guard. Next to Mekhi Becton? Dude, they'd have over 700 pounds on the left side. That would be hashtag fun to watch. Man, I, I would love if someone just decided to go build their offensive line like that. Be like, hey, we draft the biggest guy in every single class for like three straight years. And our offensive line is going to be like... Well over twelve hundred, like what fifteen hundred pounds? Yeah, yeah. Whatever. If they were all like I over three twenty, math in my head, uh, two thousand pounds. That's how what would it be? Um, but yes, that would be a hashtag fun to watch for sure. Get Michael on way to involved, make the trade, dude. Lay an addiction at center. <laughs> Falele. Well, he's got a, Alabama's O line already. Um, lost the train of thought there. Back to the question: Wilson or Fields? To me. I would have loved to have seen Fields with Shanahan because of what he has done in the past with running quarterbacks. Running quarterbacks, mobile quarterbacks, qu quarterbacks that can run. Mm -hmm. Don't want to offend anybody. You're not. But I think Wilson is the better just for that offense, the way it was run in San Francisco, the way kind of LaFleur ran it in Green Bay. I think he just plays with, within timing better. I think he opens it up more with his arm. Um, and boy, uh, what we saw from this past year was pretty special in terms of just accuracy, ball placement down the football field. That's who I would go with in that offense. Yeah, I, I would agree with you there. And, and the, the play for Watson, I tweeted this out yesterday that like he's going to go to a place that's going to struggle to build around him. So if you are the Jets and you hold the number two overall pick, you have that kind of you have that lottery ticket that is cheap quarterback on a rookie deal. And once you trade for Watson, yeah, the, the cap hits aren't as much as they are for the Texans because the Texans are going to eat a bunch of that bonus, but they're still in the neighborhood of like $30 million a year. And you're, you're at a, and you have, you have $60 million cap space this year, yes. But think about all the positions that you still need on that roster. You still need an entire secondary with Marcus May hitting free agency. You need three pieces along the offensive line, an entire edge rushing group, linebacker another wide receiver you need a lot mm -hmm. if you give up all your first rounders yes you you give up your next three first rounders say and we'll get to a little later what probably will take to get sean watts if you get three first rounders though for him so the two this year next year you sign a bunch of free agents you'll be better than the texans for sure but then in two years time you won't have added much talent to that roster and it will be you'll kind of be like you'll be your, that is your window then at that point. So the Jets, if I were the Jets, I, I would think a lot, I'd think pretty hard about giving up four first rounders is what it might end up taking for Deshaun Watson because because you still have a lot of needs and you're in, you're in a special place with what Zach Wilson could be. True. All right, this one's from Giant Man 8 Can you explain the Trey Lance evaluation? Because I do not see a good quarterback. I watched a couple of his games and never was impressed outside of his huge arm. His mechanics look horrible which might explain what his wild ball placement he doesn't look to be very accurate with a lot of his passes being overthrown or behind his receivers the most disappointing thing was his running his speed looked average and he doesn't have the power like cam i never see him run away from guys which is concerning given the level of competition i might be wrong but to me he isn't very impressive Oof. i i'll just say i disagree about the running aspect um i think he's even like kind of more suited to run the nfl than cam newton was in terms of like Cam Newton was tall, could be chopped down. I think Lance is like 6'3", like a little shorter, a little stouter. I don't know. I, I just think he's that running ability will translate. 
he will be a weapon as a runner in your offense. And then also, like, you cannot, like, the way he then opens up the entire field with his arm, and I do agree about the mechanics. He, he has a dip in his throwing motion. You would like it if he got with someone and cleaned that up. And his accuracy hasn't been great. Like, yeah. I mean, his huge arm his and his huge arm athletic ability and rushing ability is what's driven the conversation. Yes. He needs to get better in, from an accuracy perspective and from a mechanics perspective. The the I guess the explanation here of the evaluation is what that the payoff of what that could become. It's like buying a lottery ticket for like the Powerball right now. Mm -hmm. Very topical. It's at like 785 million. All I didn't my know friends are buying it. It's it's like really high right now. It's like buying a ticket for that versus buying a scratch off. You 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 can get that scratch off in the first round and maybe you'll win 20 bucks and maybe that's good. Like that's Mac Jones. You you'll have a solid quarterback. But if you hit on the Powerball, you're set for life. You, if you hit on Trey Lance, if he develops after one year of playing college football, after you know showing up 30 pounds lighter to North Dakota State, basically being an entirely different guy uh, and very like young in his developmental curve, if that curve starts going upwards with his tools, you got Josh Allen right now. That's mm -hmm. why they drafted yep. Josh Allen right now. You can say the same things about him coming out of Wyoming. So that's just what I'm telling you, the reason why you take that chance. Yep. I mean, and that's the reason why you develop quarterbacks like that with tools. Like mm -hmm. we've talked about the development problem in the NFL. You know, like we, you have to develop these guys that are potential lottery tickets. Yeah. You know, you have to groom these guys for one, two, three years if they do have all the tools. Yeah. You know, you have to, if you have legitimate high end ceiling tools, you better try and see it. You mm -hmm. better try and play him through it and get him better, add weapons around him, build around him to a point where you can see him at his best. And that's what the Buffalo Bills are seeing right now. Yeah. And it's one thing if, again, a guy is been at a blue blood high school and then starts for four years in college like you're like to the drew lock and you're still issues like you've been through good coaching still has those massive issues mm -hmm. then you get worried then yeah. it, will it ever change well it's fair to get but worried it, absolutely yeah but if a guy has but you're still still worth taking that chance on drew lock in the second i don't think anyone like hated on that pick when they made it mm -hmm. that was everyone's like okay yeah, that's fine so all right this is from reviewer man Jamar Chase, I've read a lot about Chase's lack of ability to separate and how corners were comfortable getting their hands on him at the line of scrimmage. Is this something that will be an issue for him in the NFL, or is it something fixable? That's not uh, – that's an issue. Yeah, I mean, like, I'm not going to say I'm not worried. There's He has negatives to his game. Um, he's not a shifty guy. He is not like Devontae Adams as a guy who get off the line of scrimmage. He's not going to cross you over. He's not, you're not Devontae Smith either. Like, that's not how he wins at the line of scrimmage. But he is built like a rock. Like he wins at the line of scrimmage because he can just plow through your hands. Mm -hmm. Like he can give you one step and still get through you. And he explodes off the line of scrimmage. Like he's his release. Uh, if he's if he could step on you, he's stacking you, and like then you're toast. You, you are not gonna not gonna reset. You're not gonna be able to play him at the catch point because he's too good there. So yes, it's an issue that he's not. You know, he's not a necessarily complete physical specimen by any means in terms of how he gets off the line. But I think. Like Julio Jones, same similar issues. Like he is not a guy that's going to completely shake you at the line of scrimmage, Julio Jones. But if you get stacked by Julio Jones, if you give him an inch, if you don't get a clean shot on him, you're toast. So I think a lot of guys will not even like you. You you would worry about pressing him at all. He's one of those guys where like you worry about even trying to press him at the mm -hmm. NFL level. I mean, there are re there are multiple ways to win at the line of scrimmage yeah, at the release. Absolutely. And Jamar Chase isn't Amari Cooper. You know, he's not like giving people the buttery release and getting off. But what he does do is throw dudes off of him. Yeah. Like he is an absolute bully at the line of scrimmage. Like turn on the Alabama game. Like watch him against Trayvon Diggs. All routes, not just targets, all routes. Mm -hmm. This is, Trayvon Diggs has to like hang on the dude to stay with him. Like hang on his jersey because he's just throwing him around the field. Um, I think there's, I, li I, I like the, like the comparison to Julio Jones. He's not Julio Jones, but like Julio Jones doesn't shake people like Amari Cooper does at the line. What he does is win with physicality. I think Jamar Chase will do that as well. All right, from Alex Ernest. Love the podcast. Thank you all for the content. Love the pod. I've been really curious if you all think a QB needy team should trade for Jordan Love this offseason. What's your take? Please, God. Someone someone give up a first for him. Not um, a first. No one's trading a first for Jordan Love. Why not? It would actually, his... I feel like it would almost be worth more if you thought he was a first late rounder first. Last year. Now a the fact that he wasn't even the second string quarterback obviously concerning, but 
like if you thought he was first rounder last year, you knew he wasn't going to be good as a rookie. And now you have to pay him less if you trade a first rounder for him than you would your own first rounder because no signing bonus, whatever. That could be appealing. No, you're not going to get a first rounder for him. At that point, if you're the Packers, they'd be stupid to trade for him, to trade him away. You're like you made that investment. It shouldn't have changed your mind. You didn't think he was going to overtake Aaron Rodgers as a starter. So I think they'd be dumb to do it with already having put that investment in. But if they watched him and said, oh, shit, we we fucked this up. We did not. We thought he'd be better than he was. Mm-hmm. And he stinks. Then by all means, go ahead and deal him. But I, yeah, Green Bay knows the most about him right now. Yeah. So if they're if Green Bay is going to deal him, that's a red flag in and of itself. <laughs> so True. I would not, if I was quarterback need team, make a trade for Jordan. Because you call Green Bay right now and you say, hey, we're interested in Jordan Love. Like, oh, we love Jordan Love. The only reason we kept him as third string is we want to protect him from COVID, protect yeah. him from everyone, protect him from the world. But yeah. if he's actually not playing that well or whatever it means, I mean, they're not going to tell that. They're going to bluff their whole way through it. Yeah. All right. This is from OG Capital Money Sign Money Sign. The review is great analysis and an underrated dynasty podcast. I don't play dynasty football, but I do I do respect that if you do play dynasty fantasy, you draft rookies every year, right? And I think if you are listening to No, I think you just like draft anyone every year. Oh, really? Like you can just But you have like a team that stays year over year. Yeah, well that's that's a keeper league. I think you're high. Dynasty is where your we team stays put. Fantasy. And yeah. then the only players that you're drafting are rookies. Because every team is, or every player is accountable. There's free agents, obviously. Not every single, oh. like not every single player in the NFL is accountable. It's, like, I, th- I think most leagues, like I'm in a dynasty league, and I think you keep like, I think it's 12 guys. Uh, okay. So if you have 16 man roster, you keep 12 guys. But uh, I mean, gotcha. you could keep, you could keep as many as you want. It's I thought you fun. could just like, you see Jerry Judy is a five star recruit. You could just keep stash him on your roster for. A oh while. wow, draft him like since high school. That's nuts. That's like deep in the weed <laughs> shit. That's not. <laughs> I think that's. I, I don't. I don't play that. I think that's Debbie. Tough. I've heard Debbie is a, a league option where oh. you can draft guys out of like college and shit. Oh, okay, I don't know. Either that's... way, his his question is: <laughs> How many offensive tackles would need to be off the board for the Steelers to consider a different position, and what should they go for? Also, what are evaluators going to do with Jamie Newman? He's going to the Senior Bowl, right? Newman. Yes, that's going to be huge for him. It's actually kind of a low-key, you know, good quarterback group at Senior Bowl. Jamie Newman, Kyle Trask, Mac Jones. Very excited. Uh, the three best quarterbacks in the SEC this past year. Um, but the six the six guys I'd feel good about at tackle, if I was the Steelers drafting there, obviously Penny Sewell's, he'll be gone. Rayshon Slater, Christian Derrissaw, likely gone. At that point, Tevin Jenkins, Oklahoma State, Samuel Cosme, Texas, Alex Leatherwood, Alabama. If you draft them there, middle or later in the first round, I'm not going to argue. That's you need a tackle. You need better pass protection in the future. It's one of your few, you know, quote unquote needs on that roster. I wouldn't want to pigeonhole myself into either. I think the one guy I'd feel like very good if he was there is Christian Derrissaw. Would love Tevin Jenkins, Sam Cosme, Alex Leatherwood. Is kind of like you'd have to talk me into it a little bit. But if if that's where you're going to go. Six would it have to be off the board for me to just be like, no, I'm not going to draft tackle at all. I also don't think they need to pigeon them ho- pigeonhole themselves into any position, even off to tackle at that spot. Like you, they, can- yeah, they're kind of old. Like cornerback wasn't a need, but now Joe Hayden's old. You know, D- uh, defensive line obviously one of the best in the NFL, but now Bud Dupree might be gone. Mm-hmm. Um, and Cameron Hayward's only getting older. Yeah, so we'll see. Yeah. Uh, from Will Rich underscore one one six wide receiver one question: Does it feel like people are overrating Devontae Smith? Yes, because he's <laughs> produced at a high level more than more recently than Jamar Chase. Obviously, you guys have fallen into this trap. You haven't fallen into this trap, but people, I imagine it's mostly for clicks, have shot Smith above Chase on some public mocks and boards. Is the gap that is is the gap that close, or is evaluators being short sighted with recency bias? It feels obvious to me that Chase put up elite numbers as a sophomore with Jefferson on the field, while Smith didn't do as well with Waddle on the field and is one year older. I I, I agree. I, I do think some people are overrating Devontae Smith. And we'll talk about this maybe in February or something, but Dane Brugler, one of the more respected draft analysts, guy we've had on the podcast multiple times, came out with his draft board today. He has Chase at three, I think. And then Devontae Smith at seven and Waddle at eight. We have Chase in a similar... Chase is wide receiver one, and then Waddle and Smith at seven and eight, respectively. Like... I do think some people, like, we'll tweet out mock drafts from the main account on PFF, and if Devontae Smith isn't drafted inside the top three, they're like, oh my God, are you guys idiots? Are you guys stupid? He's obviously the best receiver in this class. Benjamin Solak of the Draft Network 
didn't get as much heat for this. We know when I say the highest I drafted him is six, people are in my mentions wanting to kill me. He, ca- he says, Devontae Smith was great. He's now a prospect, and he's not as good as some of these other guys. Like You have to evaluate Waddle and Chase differently as prospects. Devontae Smith, I get, was a fantastic college football player. The first Heisman since Desmond Howard. You can't overrate him yeah. for that production. But it's like, how did Desmond Howard do in the league? Not so, but like, exactly. Like college production is college production. We've we've fallen trapped to overrating college production ourselves. Like it's still, Paul Dawson. It's still what you did on a college football field, and then the role you had in that offense. Is he going to get the most screens in the NFL next year? Probably not. He's not probably gonna, not going to get the most screens in the NFL. He's not a lot. Not a lot of rookies come in and get featured in that offense right away. And so th- right away, once you're not getting those scheme targets zap off about like 500 yards of his production like right off the top and this is not and i hate like even having this conversation because devontae smith's incredible yeah He's incredible eighth wide on receiver. our board yeah i don't I, I, I it sucks that we have to have so many conversations about like not liking him like it's a difference of like five picks yeah. in terms of where we'd want to select like him. his tape was electric there's not a lot of issues it on sucks because i loved him yeah. i loved Devontae smith going into this season i said in a tweet like he could be wide receiver one and then like now i have to freaking defend myself because i don't want to draft him inside the top three i don't get it yeah. i don't get it it's just other guys are good too is yeah. i guess the best way to defend this position other guys are very good. i think the most upset fan base and, right now and and situation is very important mm-hmm. in the offensive end he was in the most favorable role you could be in for a wide receiver in terms of producing that's just that. The most upset fan base right now is when any Dolphins draft does mock draft doesn't have Devontae Smith at three because they want to compare him with Tua and all that stuff. It blows my mind that we were here last year being like, hey, they should, they should probably take a wide receiver too. Like there's wide receiver groups not that great. Mm-hmm. Like it kind of got pumped up a little bit. They're like, no, bigger needs. Everyone's like, Devontae Smith three now. It's like same yeah, with the Giants. I mean, the Giants are the same spot. Like yep, last Giants. year, it's like, we have Darius Slayton. Are you high? Oh, I need a receiver now. Maybe even a tight end. <laughs> like, I mean, it's it needs are the dumbest thing. I'll say it again. Needs are the most overrated thing in the draft. I, yep. I don't understand why draft need is as prevalent they as this. We need an offensive tackle. sway tackling. year to year just like so wildly. When you realize that, like thinking we need X Think as a fan. Is think so as a dumb. fan. I want every Giants fan right now and, and some other fans as well if you can. What did you think you needed last year? And now what do you think you need this year? Yeah. And how di- how different are those needs? And why does it matter that and by the time the second year needs like the Giants needing receiver they need a year two receiver they don't need a rookie one they need mm-hmm. a guy that's like breaking yeah. out as a second year receiver like draft ahead of the needs you know what I mean and I think when when it comes to that like just draft the best player I mean BPA has gotten over I mean over said at a certain point but like I don't know I, I I hate bringing up needs anyway two questions from Lil Hoops 2007 hey gents great content Stack or tier your top 10 QBs for the upcoming draft and then rank the top 10 QBs still in college, regardless of class. I'm a Lions fan who sees a QB need for us in the next five years. My plan is tank for Arch Manning in 2026. I love it. I love that. I, uh, QB need is different, though. I will say that. Like we say, like throw needs out the window. Like needing a quarterback is different. Like yeah. that is like, yeah, you need to address that or else your team will just lose a ton of fucking football games. So, um, but anyway, rank these. Uh, let's rank these. All right. So I actually ended up missing when I first read through this. I missed the second part of the question in terms of rank the top 10 QBs in college still. I'll just give off the top of my head some of the best that I have. But okay. I didn't actually pre- prep that one. My bad, uh, little hoops. But little hoops. <laughs> the tiers, I tiered them. And I only did eight because really there's only eight in this class that I could really give too much of a shit about. After that, it's kind of uh, hodgepodge. There's a tier of Trevor Lawrence. He is his own tier. Then there's a tier of Zach Wilson and Justin Fields. They are... Their own tier, which is a which is a pretty damn good tier that you'd throw throw probably Joe Burrow in that tier. Like I'd throw Baker Mayfield in that tier. That's wow. that's a good tier to be in. Then I'd have a tier of Trey Lance, which he's almost like a tier that's just over to the right of all the other tiers. And he's just like like I said, that lottery ticket. Everyone else is a different type of lottery ticket. He's it's just a different if you're you're either you're either going to have you're either going to be willing to design an offense around Trey Lance that plays to a strength that uses his running ability or you're not and you're not going to go for him like he's not going to be everyone's cup of tea then there's a tier of Mac Jones and Kyle Trask where it's like damn they played good football this year they can't run they're not mobile particularly mobile they had 
two first round wide receivers, both of them. And they don't have legit arm talent. Like and they don't have like, yeah. and like top tier one, tier two arm talent. I think Kyle Trask is actually like, I don't, yeah, it's not tier one, tier two. It's not, it's all the guys above them probably have stronger arms. Mm-hmm. So that's, their, that's that tier. And then I'd throw Jamie Newman and Kellen Mond, Texas A&M quarterback in the tier of maybe, like maybe these guys can win some games at the NFL level. Really tough to say. And really had some like, they just, they didn't play elite. They just never played elite in college. And where's Felipe Franks in that tier? <laughs> Do you like Felipe Franks? I know no. Steve mentioned to it recently. Like, mentioned to it, mentioned it to us recently. Felipe Franks, I will say, if he's done one cool thing, he that has best the throw. farthest yeah. throw we've charted. And it's the sickest throw. Yeah, the, the Hail Mary. That thing is the that dopest. The that is, I think, the coolest throw in college football I've ever seen. Yeah. Felipe Franks, I think it's at like, it uh it's it's when he was still at florida like <laughs> look it up just look up felipe frank's hail mary and it is the fucking coolest yeah. throw it was like a decade ago it feels like yeah so it was, I think it was he could be on the all name team too felipe that's kind of that's a good name i like felipe frank's yeah that's a good one it sounds like um a brand of hot dogs it does frank's that's a great connection mike <laughs> that was brilliant thank you <laughs> uh this is from alan hyphen hyphen 89 question for mike renner you're the gm of the packers you're also a stakeholder of the Packers. Soon. Who do you draft at 32? Shareholder. Ba- I love that he says, who do you draft at 32? Based on everything you know about Gutenkunst, oh, I've- Gutenkunst, who do you think he will draft and why will it be an unranked running back? <laughs> go, Pack, go. I'm drafting a wide receiver. This is the year. Shut up. I'm praying Kadarius Toney. Praying to the heavens. He'd be perfect for that offense. I mean, we talked about Brandon Ayuk being perfect for San Francisco last year. Kadarius Tony's like Brandon Ayuk on steroids in terms of what he could do physically. Um, perfect for that offense. So I'm praying for Kadarius Tony. Realistically, I bet they go O line or D line. Like it's a strong edge class. They probably going to cut Preston Smith. Um, like I said, they they don't really obviously give a shit about what their needs are on that roster, which I respect. They drafted Rashawn Gary when they did had signed just two free agents. He's played really well this year. And he played well of late. Or offensive line where keep strength, strength, like keep that dominant offensive line intact. And again, another class where it's strong at a position. And so you're at 32, you'll get a guy that usually wouldn't be at 32 in other classes. And I think that's where kind of, it's kind of been the Packers MO to a degree. Next question here. This is from Brad VH1 1994. Bengals question. Might have to get Quinn's opinion here. Assuming both are available, should the Bengals take Jamar Chase versus Panay, or, or Panay Sewell? Also, are there any other picks to even consider, assuming they keep William Jackson the third? I would take Sewell over Jamar Chase. I would too. I would take Sewell over Jamar Chase. And I, if they're both available, I don't think you could consider any other picks. I think it's Chase or Sewell there, or really just Sewell or no one. Yep. But if both of those guys are gone, I don't think that will be the case. I don't think both will be gone. I think you have to trade back. I think there's opportunities to trade back there because there's going to be quarterbacks left on the board. Like yes. you, again, I I hate beating a dead horse, but like if they're picking at five and one of the top three quarterbacks still hasn't been picked, that pick is more valuable than if all three are gone or even Trey Lance is gone as well. Like I'm sorry, like try and get more value out of that pick. The Bengals aren't a Penesul away from going to the postseason or deep in the postseason. They're not. They're probably two or three guys away, and they're going to lose some guys in free agency. Carl Lawson, a free agent. Yeah. William Jackson, a free agent. They still have to try and find a way to pay Jesse Bates. Like. This is a team that has a ton of holes. Trading back, if there's a quarterback on the board at five, makes the most sense to me. Yes, and I, I think the best way to look at this would be P- Panay Sewell I, I'm on board with because he's he's that level of safety. You know, kind of like Chase Young last year. You just know you're getting elite play. Like you, there's no ri- the, the risk is low. The risk is about as low as it gets. Injury is the risk at that point. After him, can't necessarily say that about any of these prospects. So, one Rayshon Slater, one Christian Darisaw is not going to impact your offensive line as much with everything we know about offensive line play being a weak link proposition where if you have one guy who's awful, it can torpedo your whole offensive line as then adding like Samuel Cosme and Liam Eikenberg. Adding two guys mm-hmm. to that offensive line could do. That with and if you trade back you will get two picks that are capable of adding two starting offensive linemen in year one that's what you should do dude Instead Deontay of, Brown give him cornbread 
And then he could be, remember we said we could move his nickname to like five way or something. Or that yeah. was Tyler Shelvin. It's pretty good. Still pretty, pretty good. good. Yeah. Um, let's now jump to Azana K. Remember, all of these are on the Apple Podcast reviews. Like, if you want your question answered every single week, go in there on Apple Podcast and leave a review and leave a question. Uh, first, I'd like to say I like the work you guys do and keep it up. Thumbs up emoji. Last I checked, you guys had Bateman ranked as a fifth, the number 15 prospect. Could you see him drop to the late first due to lack of playtime this season? And he also mentions um, that he's not a guy that will probably test off the charts at the combine. There won't be a combine, but I don't even expect his pro day video to be like a legitimate. Yeah, he might not even drop away. He might not even. Try yeah. he might even try the camera dancer route. Um, he said, "I like the shout here." He said, it "Reminds me of Keenan Allen." I see that. That's that's the type of player. Mm-hmm. I think that's like best case scenario. He's a Keenan Allen type of player. Um, I don't. I don't think he's gonna. If he drops to the late first, it's not gonna be too to lack of playing time. It's gonna mm-hmm. be because the athleticism. Yeah, like it's gonna be because he's a four five four six guy that doesn't like trades. completely it's, wow you as it's an athlete. It's gonna be because why DeAndre Hopkins fell to the back end of the first round. Like because they're not wow athletes. Why T. Higgins fell to the top second? If when you're not that special of an athlete, teams aren't see it as more risky. Even if like shitty ch- text like ticks like every other box you could want about mm-hmm. the position. So uh, teams see it as more risky because there's less of a chance he blows the fuck up. Like he becomes like this great. You know, it's yeah. not. It's not necessarily. Bateman's not risky because like the majority. Well, I mean, he probably of, he might suck in the NFL. Yeah. I think it's more that like, oh, I, I know if I draft him. There's a lower chance, like his range of outcomes is not like, you know, at a freaky athlete type of receiver that like like a megatron. Like that's not, just yeah. Not every freak athlete becomes an elite player, but the majority of elite players are freak athletes. Have some sort of freak freak shot list. Wow. All right, uh, depressed Vikings fan. I love that name. He left this review. Love the pod. What third or fourth round guard do you think the Vikings could draft to be a day one star? This is depressing me. <laughs> You're looking at third or fourth round guards in your off season? Man, I'm sorry. I'm sorry this is happening. Who's your guy here? I will give you two names. One, Creed Humphrey. Now he played center at Oklahoma. I think he'd kick out to guard very easily, six foot five. Um and if you're the Vikings, they they want athletic offense alignment. I think he's more than athletic enough. Two, maybe not necessarily the guy you want to toss in right away, but I, I think he could get there soon. James Hudson, Cincinnati tackle, kick in the guard, start off as a defensive lineman. So I should tell you former Michigan that he's recruit, yes. right? That transferred to Michigan recruit started on the defensive line there at Michigan, transferred to Cincinnati, switched off as tackle. And play pretty well at off tackle for really like being new to the position. I think he'll be there in that range and would fit the bill for them. Knowing the, you know, Cincinnati Bearcats beat riders and even and hearing some of what the coaches have said about Hudson, like this guy is loved. Like yeah. they loved having him. And when he w- left the game, I think due to injury or a suspension or something or ejection. No, he had that's the targeting, which yeah, was he, right. He had butted the legitimate guy. Legitimate target. <laughs> like we <laughs> we debate some targetings here and there. That one, it was like hilarious. It was against one of the top corners too uh, for Georgia. Campbell Stokes. Or Stokes. I think it was Stokes. And it was just like three seconds after the play, just straight rocked him and then put the hands up like, whoa. And then the backup that came in was got absolutely torched yeah. by Aziz Ojolari. Like, Aziz Ojolari right? is going to get drafted. And on the NFL Network broadcast, it's going to be that guy getting toasted. Yeah. Like back to back. He might not want to watch. He might not want to watch. Round. All right. First pick Nick with his review. This has turned into my favorite podcast to listen to. I'm fortunate here. Mike, stay strong with Dry January. (laughs) First pick, Nick, I hate to break it to you. Sit down if you haven't. If you're standing, sit down. Or if you're running or whatever. Mike has broken Dry January. And this weekend, we have quite the Only once, though. Only once. I mean, only one session of drinking. Mm. I haven't drank since. So it's a Dry January minus one day. Yeah. Great. Um, uh, I think when football's on, January is... Soaking wet is, is <laughs> Jesus <the> Christ. <laughs> Soaking wet? My God. All I'm right. Let's think. get to freaking first picks Nick's first pick Nick's question. Let's say the top four QBs and top two corners are gone at nine for the Broncos. Where could you see them going? Could they add another weapon in Waddle or Pitts? Or maybe offensive line? Love to know your thoughts. Man, no no one more weapon is gonna flip the light on for Drew Locke mm-hmm. if, if that's your plan. So I, I don't think that's – it's kind of like what we said with Mitch Trubisky last year. Like the Bears don't need any – add any more offense. They're like you're getting diminishing returns there. It's just either Trubisky's going to figure it out or he's not. Either Locke's going to figure it out with how many weapons they got or he's not. Where I could go see going offensively is offensive tackle. Jawan James now hasn't like played in two years, right? Like they signed him 
and he's just done nothing and he has a pretty big contract and he's 30 years old now and you have no clue what you're going to get when he comes back. So I could see that and obviously like you could have someone who starts on the interior and then kicks out to tackle in time if Juwan James does come back and play. You could also see Micah Parsons. It would be interesting to me. Mm-hmm. Micah Parsons and Vic Fangio. Think back to his 49ers days. Patrick Willis, Navarro Bowman. Could be fun. I think and Parsons, in my opinion, would be he's the he's the type of linebacker that'd be worthy of a top ten pick. I, I was on a Broncos podcast last night with Joe Rowles. I don't know if you follow Joe Rowles on Twitter. Yeah. It's Joe Rowe underscore NFL. Great follow on Twitter. But he we were talking about the Broncos draft, obviously, and like it would be a bad beat if the top four quarterbacks and the top two corners are off the board by nine. Yeah. I think they're picking at nine. Yeah, that would be a bad beat because I think they should target Sertan or Farley right mm-hmm. out of the gate. Like the, if those one of those guys is on the board, I'd take Farley and, uh, over Sertan. But like both those guys would be great picks at nine. And after that, I really like your idea for Michael Parsons if he falls that far. I think um, offensive tackle makes sense because he, we talked about Jawan James and like it's unlikely that he comes back next year or even plays. So we'll see um, with that. But yeah. that would be a bad beat if you can't even swing the bat on Lance or one of the top two corners at nine. You just got sauced in the draft. It really would. And also because Farley, Sertan, I, I doubt Farley and Sertan will both be gone in this. I agree. In any I also doubt that. But like after them, uh, J.C. Horns, cornerback three on our board he'd be a terrible fit for this game they're not gonna draft jc horn i um, i just don't like he's a press man corner with and it go when you go to a scheme where he's never gonna run that yeah so. um and this well, is so another broncos a lot question. of press he can he can also play off so this is another broncos question yeah um very enjoyable and entertaining podcast how do the broncos get sean watson if they can't should they address the quarterback quarterback and the draft for i'll start here because we talked about this last night too it, it's deshaun Making a move for Deshaun Watson at, for the Denver Broncos would take a lot of picks and all that stuff. And I, I think you've made good comments about like, hey, like you're gonna you're gonna struggle to build around him, and there's a lot that needs to be done. But like they do have some weapons there, like, and their offensive line has played better. Like I I like a conversation with Nick Casario. Like they should at least have the conversation, yeah. and see what they can do to bring in Deshaun Watson. If it becomes more than three for three first rounders, maybe four, multiple second round picks, like then it starts to get a little bit harder. But regardless, because the first question I was asked is, what are their draft needs? It's quarterback. I'm sorry. Like as much. Like, you need to make an upgrade or at least try to make an upgrade at the quarterback position, whether you're drafting one at nine, moving up to draft one, or swinging a huge bat on Deshaun Watson. I think getting aggressive at that position makes the most sense for the Denver Broncos. Yes, and and your offense, like I kind of just said, your offense is not bad because of your playmakers. Adding another playmaker is not going to get you that next level. Adding another offensive lineman is not going to get you that next level. Drew Locke turning into a good quarterback would get is. Is, is what it's going to take yes. to get you to that next level. Or someone like Deshaun Watson playing behind with that off sign with all those weapons is will take you to that next level. So I, I am not sure, one, they're the, they're the team that should be going Deshaun Watson but because they're, they're kind of primed for this quarterback class. Like I feel like they can get involved in this quarterback class. And also kind of what I touched on in terms of they – they don't have a lot of young talent on that. Like John Elway had not been great drafting for a while. Like you have uh Cortland Sutton, you have Jerry Judy. KJ Hamler, no fan. Uh, Albert how, O. How many I'm saying like how many real building block pieces on their rookie deals right now do you have? Not you t- are paying your best players. You're paying Garrett Bowles right now. You're paying Von Miller right now. You're gonna pay Justin Simmons if you retain him in free agency. Like you, you don't have a lot of positions on that roster that are you know like the Washington football team where they got Chase Young they got Montez Sweat they got Terry McLaurin they got building block pieces that they're not paying right now Mm -hmm. that you have and yeah you could say you have cap space but like that goes away quickly to fill out a roster when you're not getting first rounders because you have to pay all of them yeah at the market rate so that's where I'm at makes sense it's it's an interesting situation for Denver man like I'm crossing your fingers and hoping Drew Locke takes a Josh Allen like leap is just a tough one like you are playing your way into next year's quarterback class if that's if if you're doing that like you're either going to be drafting inside the top three next year or you see a Drew Locke significant but that they're not because like Vic Fan just too good a coach in my opinion yeah that's fair I definitely don't think Banjo should be on the hot seat like if anyone should be on the hot seat it's the quarterback like he is the one I mean the person who was on the hot seat is gone now John Elway was the one who should have been. Well, he's actually in a bigger role. Yeah. He failed upwards. Um, All right. Two more questions left on the mailbag episode, and then we'll jump to the Quiddy Pay interview. Uh, This one's from Is Ninja. What team will pull the trigger on Kyle Pitts out of nowhere in the top 10? Carolina was a name that came to mind. 
I mean, Carolina was a team that came to mind that maybe could pull the trigger on Pitts. Cowboys. Cowboys, too. Cowboys. They never lack flash. They don't, don't underestimate Jerry's want for the splash. That was who I mocked them in the my splash. first mock draft for 2021. And I... I did it when they were picking number five, and Cowboys fans were pissed. That they've come around, like they like Pitts. They are coming around. They've come around to Kyle Pitts. I don't like you should because he's fucking awesome. Mm-hmm. Like he's that offense, the way to win in the NFL. What we see in the past few years, the most unstoppable offense wins the the most games usually. I've heard some comparisons to Colin Johnson. What's your take on that? Like yes, uh, <laughs> Jesus Christ, yeah, I've heard those comparisons too. Um, I wholeheartedly disagree with them but to if you have the most dominant offense in the nfl and yes you have to get better defensively you can't have as if you have as bad a defense as they had you're probably still not going to win a super bowl you got to get better on that side of the ball but Pitts is a game changer not a lot of pure game changers in this defensive class you can fill out your defense rounds two rounds three rounds four if you had cal Pitts and you keep Dak prescott you have a top three offense next year what about philly for Kyle Pitts at six it's like putting more lipstick on a pig there with <laughs> any pick they make at six is going to be lipstick on a pig I mean if you have Carson Wentz under center it's going to be tough either way sometimes lipstick on a pig is nice I don't know what that is referencing <laughs> I was going to say that explains your dating life <laughs> that it does it really does um, alright last question of the mailbag episode until next week it's uh, from Brock G 32 and if you left a review on Apple Podcasts and we didn't get to them I guarantee we're getting to them next week but I love the podcast. It's my go-to for draft analysis. My question is for the most recent podcast is how should the Colts approach this offseason to try and make a Super Bowl run? They have a lot of young talent and roster and a roster with few holes, but don't have a franchise quarterback. So they're an interesting situation. Hmm. Um beg Andrew Luck. Like get on your I don't knees, hate that. I don't offer hate that. some ownership stake. Whatever you can. I don't think that's actually legal. Uh, it's not. Cap. But <laughs> That would get you there. Um, after that, they are kind of they, they're in a window with a lot. Of, like they they've had a ton of draft picks. It's a young roster still, but their quarterback position obviously sucks. Like it's the, easily the issue there. And they, they'll heavily. I, I think they'll be one of the teams calling Detroit for Matt Stafford. I, I think. They should. After that, I'm not sure I'd want any of the other guys who may be available for trade. Carr, Jimmy G, Carr, Dak, Jimmy Wentz. Jimmy G, Dak, Wentz. I don't think that's getting me necessarily over the hump. Dak, possibly. Mm-hmm. But I hope we see a tag and trade for Dak because the content would just be chef's freaking oh, it kiss. Be. It'd be but so fantastic. I don't think Dallas, Dal- that was floating when Dallas was like four or five. Now at 10, they're, just, they're not going to get their guy QB otherwise. So last resort but not if they tag and trade to like some, you you mentioned this before not if they tag and trade someone who's drafting in the top three I guess yeah true if someone wants it but um, Cam Jameis if I'm going honestly Cam almost I don't want to say he got he wasn't great this year no but he didn't look like he had completely fallen off like he couldn't play whatsoever and we saw how bad Tom Brady was last year in a same situation with no one to throw to and then how good he was when he did have someone to throw to. I think Cam could be an interesting, if I'm going to kick the tires anywhere, and especially because he got a monster O-line. Even with without Anthony Costanzo, one of the best offensive lines in the NFL still. And you got Jonathan Taylor back there. You'll have a dominant running game if you add a running threat at the quarterback position. I've got a name for you. So Sam Darnold. Whew. I, I don't <laughs> He's know. He's not taking yeah. them to the postseason, maybe, but like Frank Reich, the quarterback whisperer, I don't hate it. I don't hate it. If like you can't make a power play it's a for or Cam, honestly, I think Cam would be my best bet there because you keep the flexibility, you keep your picks. That's who I would go if I was the Colts. Fair enough. Fair enough. That's gonna do it for the mailbag episode. Now, uh, let's go ahead and jump to the Quitty Pay interview. <sighs> Joining the Two Four Drafts podcast is none other than Michigan edge defender, or I guess former michigan edge defender quitty pay projected to be one of the first round picks in the 2021 nfl draft a rhode island native now working out in arizona with exos uh quitty it's great to have you on the show thank you for having me of course man i've been excited to talk to you for a while now i mean your background that's where i want to start your background is insane to give you a little kind of context i work on the draft guide here at pff and i look at you know prospect backgrounds and those things obviously born i think what in guinea correct and then moved to moved to rhode island 
as what, what, how old were you when you moved to Rhode Island? Maybe like six months, I would say. Oh my goodness! So moved to Rhode Island at six months old, and then do, you didn't pick up a football until what high school, or was it a little bit before that? No, so actually, um, my first sport was track, but then like soon, like right after that, when I was like maybe like eight or whatever, that's when we started playing football. Gotcha. And then you played running back in high school at Rhode Island. You were yeah. listed as a three-star recruit coming out, but played bulk majority running back in high school. Talk to me about that. How fun was that? So growing up, I always growing up, everyone always told me like, "Oh no, you're too big to p- play in, uh play halfback and whatnot." So I always idolized um, Brandon Jennings from the Giants. And I'm like, man, like he's six two and he's <laughs> chilling the rock. So man, like I was trying to be just like him, but um. Yeah, I played uh, running back all the way up until uh, freshman year of high school. I was freshman year of high school. I was safety and running back, and then sophomore year, they I strictly played uh, defensive end, and that was my first year ever playing uh, D line. And then junior year, that's when I started playing both sides of the ball. And then senior year, that's when I uh, majority of my playing time was uh, halfback. Gotcha, man. And how big were you then? I know right now listed at what six foot four, two seventy two is where you see mo- where you're listed mostly. But how big were you in high school? In high school, I was I was real lean. You know, like when I came out, I was like two thirty, two forty ish. But yeah, like I was I was real lean because I was still uh, running track at that time, so I couldn't have been like you know over like two forty and whatnot. What events the, did you track. What events did you participate in in track? So freshman year. Um, Freshman sophomore, my best events was the long jump, actually. And then um, I was always on the relay team. I was on the 4 by one indoor 4 by 2 um, Freshman year and sophomore year, I did 4 by 4 and then year in long jump as well. And it, so when did you, you know, kind of first realize, because I know you were heavily recruited. I know Harbaugh was big on getting you to Michigan. But when did you first realize, because you weren't a five-star recruit, you weren't this decorated no. prospect like some of these other guys, just a three-star no. recruit. When did you realize that, you know, playing college ball and then potentially even going to the NFL was like a legitimate opportunity for you? Like you had a realistic chance to make that happen. Yeah. So for me, um, I would say – after my after my sophomore year, because my sophomore year we had a senior on our team named uh, Lee Moses, who was going to uh, UMass uh, on the full ride, and um, the UMass recruit came to see one of his games, and there's there's a play in that one game I have it on my sophomore film, where we're on their twenty yard line, and the halfback gets a play, and he bursts up the middle, and he's gone. And I hawk him down, and I chase him down, and I make him fumble on the one yard line, and then we uh, uh, recover the ball. And from there, he was like, "Man, like a defensive end chasing someone down all the way down the field, eighty yards." And he had like a twenty yard uh, head start on me too, and I ended up catching him and then uh, making him fumble. And after that, that's that's when I started getting uh, looks and uh, uh, my my recruiting started to go up. Yeah, man. Let's go ahead and jump now to kind of your collegiate career at Michigan. I know you originally committed to Boston College and then flipped Mm -hmm. to play at Michigan there for four years. And looking at these past two seasons, graded really, really well from PFF, had the highest pass rushing grade we've seen from you this past season at 87.1. This season had to have been nuts with COVID-19 impacting everything and abbreviated offseason. Talk to me about some of the challenges that Michigan and you yourself went through just trying to suit up every single week, let alone play at a high level and improve your draft stock and try getting to the NFL. Yeah. So now, like, uh, first off, like, they cancel our season. So um, it was kind of tough for us, you know, me coming back, going to play. Um, that was that, – I, I remember when they first canceled our season, I sat in my room. I was like, man, like, I can't believe – I can't believe this is happening. Uh, but then, you know, like, even quarantine, like, before, um, when all the facilities were shut down, we couldn't go to any fields. We couldn't go to any gyms. We couldn't go anywhere. So – me and my uh, roommate was really doing anything that we, that we could to work out. You know, we were putting gloves on and we were going to playgrounds doing pull-ups and uh, we were hitting the, the hills and uh, all, all the field work that, that we can do to probably uh, prepare us for the season. We was doing anything that, that we could. But, you know, this season was just kind of unfortunate with everything going on. Um, yeah, just it was just it was just a weird year for everybody. 
Let's talk about uh, your teammate or former teammate, um, Hutchinson, Aiden Hutchinson, who mm-hmm. was expected to potentially enter the 2021 NFL draft, decided to go back to Ann Arbor yeah. to play at Michigan. You guys were uh-huh. the dynamic duo there, two of the best edge yeah. defenders really the program has seen in recent years. Rashawn Gary is in that loop. Reese Hurst, one of the better defensive linemen that's come out of Michigan of late. But talk to me about your relationship with him and how much you guys made each other better, the competition between you two in practice and in every single yeah. game. And Aiden, Aiden's a real dog, man. Like in practice, like he he would hate to lose any rep. And if you were were to lose that rep, he'd make sure you'd wash it under time to make sure he won't lose that rep again. Uh, freshman year when he first came in, um, you can ask all the linemen on our team, and they would say Aiden Hutchinson was a dog, um, a very hard worker, dedicated to his craft. And yeah, it was kind of unfortunate when he got injured because, man, like th- this season was was gonna be crazy. Um, but you know, he's he's gonna have another opportunity to go back. And I'm telling you right now, that's a future All American, uh, automatically first round. Like that guy's gonna be a dog next year. Like I'm actually excited to 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 see what he does. I wouldn't doubt that, man. I mean, he, we've been really impressed with him. We called him, you know, one of the top 50 players in this class before he decided to go back to Ann Arbor. Let's talk about your decision to leave Michigan. Obviously, every player in college football granted that extra year of eligibility. What made what went into your decision to enter the 2021 NFL draft, and who were you talking with and all of that? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I graduated. Um, I did my four years. You know, I, I didn't rest or anything like that. Um, I just felt like – um, I came to uh, Michigan and I feel like I accomplished like what I wanted to accomplish, make sure I got my degree, uh, make sure I played my four years with my brothers. But, um, yeah, no, um, the NFL was always a dream that I had since I was a, a little kid. Um, coming from Rhode Island especially, most people don't get this opportunity to go where I'm going. And, um, you know, throughout my whole life, I always had people saying, oh, that dream's unattainable. Uh, you know, that dream's impossible. Um, or they would just look down upon my dream because they'd be like, no, like nobody's ever done it before. So that just kind of made me want to go out and achieve my dream just to, you know, honestly prove myself right and then prove a lot of these people's wrong and inspire the youth from Rhode Island as well because constantly if you're hearing, oh, you can't do this, you can't do that, it kind of just... Uh, diminishes like their goals and like their future so i kind of wanted to do this to inspire those kids to tell them like yeah like it's possible if if you really want it you can go and get it so yeah what well, you're obviously training there in arizona with exos no combine this year or i guess it's some mm-hmm. virtual element of a combine where you could potentially be putting together videos and having different nfl you know nfl personnel come check out your testing and that stuff what exactly are you training for right now in exos are there specific is there a goal weight you have in mind to get to are there are there certain tests that you're you're, you're training for specifically right now goal times those types of things um for right now i'm just trying to get my body the the um, leanest they can be, trying to get into the best shape I can be. And we're still working all the combine drills as if we're still going to have a combine. Um, I'm not sure if Exos is holding their own uh, uh, combine or whatnot, but um, I'm just we're just continuing to uh, prepare, you know, uh, regardless if there's a combine or not. Uh, it's still an opportunity to get our bodies right and improve. Going back to kind of your play at Michigan, I want to talk about, you know, what goes into your preparation every single week. I always find it fascinating, specifically with edge defender, cornerback, tackle, those types of positions where you have to train for your opposition. You have to watch film on your opposition and get an understanding of what moves work, what moves don't, how you can beat the opposition. How much film are you watching in a given game week, and what are you looking for on film to kind of prepare each week? So for for us edge guys – we're constantly uh, looking at sets. Uh, we like to see if this guy's a high setter, if he's a, if he'll come out and uh, jump set you, or um, we'll we'll focus on his stance, um, trying to see like tendencies. Does he stand up when there's a run? Does he have his hand in there when there's a run? Is his feet even when it's a run or a pass? Um, yeah, so like we just try to pick up like those small tendencies. So, like once we get into the game. We can see a stance, but all right, bet like this is probably like a pass play or a run play and whatnot. And then from there, we just watch tons and tons of tape on those tackles and see what rushes work 
well against them, what rushes they can't take, if their feet are uh, quick enough to be able to uh, recover on the counters and whatnot. So for us, it's just really game planning on, like, breaking down the tackles, tendencies, and breaking down their strengths and uh, weaknesses to take advantage of them. And how much are you kind of watching tape or working on adding moves or pass rush moves to your tool belt? I know that's a big thing coming out of college. And with a player like yourself, and we'll get into this a little bit later, like you are this athletic freak with a ton of explosiveness, a ton of bend that, you know, scouts and media flock to. How are you adding to your pass rush move list? How are you adding to your, you know, your technique in those things? Yeah. So this off season, uh, specifically because um, I had a pretty good junior year. I had a couple of sacks, I mean, a good amount of sacks. But um, the big thing that I kept getting told was after when I was top of my rush, I didn't have a solid rush plan when I'm going into my rushes. So this whole offseason, um, uh, me and my D-line coach uh, and uh, a couple of my teammates really worked on it. And he asked me, um, what's a move that you really want to work? And I said, the cross shop. I think I'll – uh, being next to the cross shop and then uh, the double swipe. So the cross shop was my pr- primary move. And um, uh, we started to look at film, NFL film, on what guys do the cross shop the best. And for us, it was TJ Watt and uh, Yannick uh, Ngakwe. So watch a ton of their tape, watch how they set it up, watch how they execute it. And then, yeah, we just practiced and practiced it until uh, I felt like I got it down packed. But even then, make sure I practice it in one-on-ones, make sure I pr- didn't practice so when the game time came, I could do it in the game. Yannick Ngakwe has the cross shop down, man. I think he comes yeah. up. Every time I talk to different prospects or even players in the NFL and they bring up the cross shop and how they're working it, they bring up Yannick Ngakwe. It's one of his go-to moves, and rightfully so, he has performed really well. I have to bring this up, man, though. Bruce Feldman listed you as the number one freak on his kind of annual freaks list, and I'm sure you get talked to the, about this a ton because yeah. you reportedly – can run a six three seven three cone and a four yeah. five seven forty yard dash. I, can can I add some context here, Quiddy? That's faster. But that's faster than Tyreek Hill. <laughs> that that three Listen. cone is impressive, man. I need to hear more about this. It's really all technique, and 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 if you want the video, I got the video for you. But, I need. Um, the, I don't want the video. Yeah. I need the video. I need to see this. But, but but um for the three cone yeah it's really like all technique and like once you're comfortable with the technique you just go full tilt like like once you're confident and 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 how you can uh touch the line get back get back you know just making sure you're at 100 percent speed when you're doing it so so yeah so i just i just felt like our strength staff did a great job of teaching us technique and making sure that that we were getting right because um past winter uh so I, uh yeah yeah the the past winter one um that's all we really did was combine stuff and we we uh really worked on everything and at that 40 yard dash as well i was like 277 almost 280 now i'm like 270 i'm going down into 260 so man i'm trying to my goodness to, yeah i'm yeah i'm, I'm trying to move <laughs> This is going to be nuts. Those people at Exos, those trainers at Exos must be losing their damn mind. If you were getting under 270 and getting closer to a 455, four, you know, even sub that would be just nuts. And then the three cone, again, I'm going to ask you right after we get up th- done with this interview to text me that video. I, I need to see this. Um, the other thing I-, I wanted to mention, too, was – and kind of to pivot away from the combine stuff is I like to ask players about, you know, what motivates them, you know, what motivates you to go to the NFL. And you kind of mentioned it a little bit about, you know, showing the youth in Rhode Island that this is possible and that stuff. But I'd love to hear more about why you are motivated, why you, you know, show up every day and work as hard as you do. So for me, like my biggest motivation would be my mom. Um, for me, just because like, I just see like how, how hard, like she works every single day and I've never seen her complain and say, Oh man, I'm tired. I don't feel like going to work today or whatever. Even when I begged her to send me to um, a private school that was way out of our budget. Um, my mom made it happen. You know, she picked up a second job. She picked up part-time work and she did anything that, that she could to make sure that she could send me to that school on top of that, um, uh, support our family. Um, so for me, yeah, I just feel like I owed it to, to her to, to really try and give back to her because, like, she just sacrificed so so much for me. And, um, yeah, you know, like, just growing up, like, like it, it does something to you when when someone that you love so dear to your heart does everything that they can to uh, give you everything that they have, and that's barely anything, you know? So mm-hmm. we grew up, we struggled, and I just seen how much, how hard my mom worked, and I was just like, man, like, 
we shouldn't be living like this if you're working this hard. So for me, I was just like, I have to go. I have to go take care of you. I have to go get this bag so you can retire early. So that that's my that's my number one goal to take care of Agnes pay and make sure she's living a good life in paradise. And yeah, <laughs> that's awesome, man. I, 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 that's, that's touching, man. That's very cool. Last thing I have for you here and we'll let you go is, you know, what are there players you watch currently in the NFL that you aspire to be, or, you know, use tape for to learn from? I know you mentioned unique and Gakwe, but are there players that you think you can model in the NFL? Um, so for me, um, I don't. I didn't really play much three tech this year, but um, I remember like when I would play a, a good amount of three tech, I'd always watch Aaron Donald to see um, what he would do because he's just so explosive, and I feel like we're kind of built the same in a in a way, like, kind of like stocky. So anytime I would bump down to the three technique, I would always watch his film and try and uh, uh, imitate like his rushes and make sure like I know like how he's taking on blocks and shedding and whatnot. So yeah. Yeah, I think Aaron Donald's a good one. Do you know, I mean, I guess it's kind of adding another question to it, but I'm interested to know if you've received any feedback from, you know, NFL personnel, those things, what position you want to play in the NFL? Because you do have that build where you could play a little bit more inside at the next level or continue to play along the edge. Have you had that discussion at all or thought about that at all? Um, no, I haven't really had that uh, discussion with anybody yet. But um, for me, like, I like what I told, like, I tell everybody, like, my weight fluctuates so much where I could be – 260 250 like when i first came to exos i was 258 and now i'm 270 you know where like my weight could like just fluctuate once i start lifting once i start eating and whatnot so i could either play the edge i could if you want me to bump down to a three technique for certain packages and rush the three i could do that if you want me to stand up drop back into coverage i can do that as the outside linebacker so you know like i'm very flexible as far as like where i can play in the box so there's not really like a a smack that like label on like my uh position yeah that's good man i mean if you you know the athletic testing that you have and the athletic ability that you do have the versatility is going to be one of the first things that people bring up in your scouting profile really appreciate the time quitty i'm, I'm going to hound you for that video of this three cone i need to see it people need to see it uh, but uh, until next time man i really appreciate it and best of luck moving forward yes sir <laughs> That'll do it, man. I really appreciate it. That was quick and easy, 17 or so minutes. Uh, I wish you the best of luck, and um, we'll definitely have to catch up maybe later in the process, maybe maybe closer to March or April and, and talk some more because I really appreciate your time. Man, what an awesome guy. He really opened up, dude. He's a, he's a super nice guy, and I, I really appreciate the, you know, the answers he had for – when he talks about the three cone, he's like, it's all technique. It's like you, you just get the technique down and you go full tilt. It's like, you know what? That's kind of like you know chugging a beer in some ways. Like I feel like you get the technique down and you just go full tilt, and I think he did that. And I also talked about – I still about, don't have the technique down for I that. still don't have the technique down either, to be honest. But like his motivation for playing the – like wanting to play in the NFL, like uh, what he's working on, like all that stuff is just – is awesome to see. I'm really excited about Quiddy Pay. I came out of that interview – more impressed with Quiddy Pay than I already was. Like I, I really do see him as a top ten player in this class, top fifteen player in this class, and and likely edge one. Like I, I really do think Quiddy Pay is that damn good. Yeah, it's just that. F you sent me the video last night, and I was like, holy sh! Like it's real. It's it's insane. And I, I thought you know, quick timing, maybe six seven. Like maybe just like a a pretty strong timing error or whatever. I timed it three times. The slowest I got was six five. That's that's different level of just explosiveness and fluidity that when he said he was like, I'll like, send you the video. I was it's like, like Hello. too, too, too impressive to fail. Almost like you're 275 pounds and can move like that. Your life is very easy. You know, <laughs> like and that, he said in the interview that like he was pushing 280 on that video. And now at Exos in Arizona, he's getting closer to like 260. And like, he's talked about like potentially you know, playing outside linebacker, coming off, playing in coverage, kicking inside. Like, I'm telling you, dude, this guy's a freak. Back. Huh? Put him at running back. I, he played running back in, I mean, high school. Yeah. And he was dominant. Man, right. I'm, I'm excited about Quiddy Pay, but uh, a fantastic interview. I also, teasing next week's or maybe Monday's episode or Wednesday's episode, I talked to Michael Walker, one of our highest graded rookies this year. I'm uh, going to play that one at the end of the podcast. And you know what I brought up? Most of the conversation is about linebacker playing in the NFL and how much it's changed. And he brings up, like, how playing confident and knowing what you're doing is the most important thing in the NFL right now at linebacker. Because if you're playing, he's like, watch, watch a linebacker blitzing. It looks damn good, doesn't he? 
Watch him trying to play in coverage and being in a combo and being being in conflict with your gaps. Like that is when linebackers suck. And like I, yeah. I was really impressed. He's a smart player, man. I, I like Michael Walker a ton. Fourth round pick out of Fresno State. We'll play that one on the Monday or Wednesday episode. But until next time, till next mailbag, leave your freaking questions in the Apple Podcast Review. It's the best way to get your questions answered. Um, that's gonna do it though. Austin Gale, Mike Renner, two for one drafts.